Good Mental Health. I'm Matt Kelly. I'm pleased to be joined on today's podcast by my co-host for this show, Dr. Neil Marinello. He is a longtime behavior expert and a solutions-focused life coach in Woodstock, Vermont. Neil, as always, it's a pleasure having you on the show. My pleasure being here with you, Matt. Uh, why don't you take a few minutes and just uh, explain to our listeners a little bit about your backstory and uh, your over 60 years in uh, uh, human behavior. Uh, well, 60 years, I'm 76 years old. So that goes back uh, uh, till I was 15 or 16 years old. And uh, that was how old I was when my father died. And I very much uh, uh, have spent my life trying to be the good daddy that he was and uh, perhaps even supersede him here and there. Uh, and in my mind, uh, being a good shrink is being a good daddy. And so I've worked hard to develop my skills at uh, figuring out how to help people be better than they are. Uh, and that means basically getting inside their heads, figuring out what's right for them and uh, helping them to do the best they can. Wonderful. In uh, the effort of full disclosure, I've been a longtime client of Dr. Marinello's and can personally speak to his effect on my life. The purpose of uh, our Good Mental Health podcast is to help people uh, achieve good mental health, particularly as we're coming out of this COVID crisis. Uh, there has been a mental health crisis that has gone along with this health crisis, I think. And uh, throughout the courses or the episodes of this podcast. We're uh, going to be specifically speaking to the tweets that uh, Dr. Marinello has been uh, putting up on Twitter. And you're welcome to follow Dr. Marinello at Coach Dr. Neil. That's uh, at Coach Dr. Neil on Twitter. Today's episode is going to speak to I am the most important person in the world to myself. That is uh, one of your uh, uh, tweets and is the subject of today's podcast. So Neil, if you'd take a few minutes to really explain the thought process behind that tweet, I am the most important person in my world. Well, I think the starting point is to recognize that uh, uh, every time you remember something, you change it. That means that today is different from yesterday and the person I am today is different from the person I was yesterday. When I say every time you remember something, you change it. What I mean is if I remember something that happened yesterday or last year, uh, I'm bringing it from the part of my brain that remembers things, which is usually thought of as the hippocampus, uh, two almond shaped things on either side of the brain. And uh, uh, you bring it to your forefront and you remember it. And in the process of remembering it, uh, you change it. And the re reason you change it is because things have happened since that happened. And uh, we are interpreting it now in terms of not just what, what you remember happening, but also what, you, uh, uh, what you've learned since it happened. And then when you file it back in your mind, uh, you file it with that added information. So the thing to be aware of is that uh, who I am today is different from who I was yesterday or who I was last year. Memory, and there's been a lot of studies that show that memory is something which is not a videotape. In fact, if you really want to understand uh, what happened in any given situation, you have to do what we call BASKET, and that's uh, an acronym. B is for behavior, who was doing what, a is for affect, what feelings were people having? And there are basically four feelings, mad, sad, glad, and scared. Uh, and uh, S is for sensations. Uh, what of your senses were operating and what were you experiencing in terms of seeing, seeing, uh, hearing, smelling, uh, touching, that kind of thing. And um, K is the knowledge. If you watch a videotape of something over and over and over again, eventually you'll figure out exactly who is feeling, sensing, uh, and behaving, what and why. So uh, uh, the easiest way to say it is that uh, uh, each of us changes with every moment uh, we live until we die. And the truth is that no one knows what happens what, after we die. Uh, the question that we are all asking ourselves is, am I better now than I was then? Uh, I think I'm doing the best I can, and my idol, Milton Erickson, uh, made the statement that he believed that everyone is doing the best they can. Uh, I had a lot of trouble with that, but uh, 
uh, the 60 years or so I've been in this business trying to understand how people think, I've realized he was right. Uh, so if I'm doing the best I can, uh, or I think I'm doing the best I can, then the other question that comes up is, is my thinking right? Mm. Am I thinking the right way right now? And if I can change the way I'm thinking uh, so that I can believe I'm doing the best I can, then I actually am doing better than I was doing yesterday or the day before. Uh, the question of, uh, am I the most important person in my life? The answer is, uh, uh, all I know is me. I'm the only person that I know. And even if I devote my life, even if I'm Mother Teresa and I'm devoting my life to helping others, that doesn't change the fact that that's the most important thing in my identification of who I am. It's interesting, you, you've, you've started here in a way that I thought was quite different than uh, what I thought you would say as a, as a starting point for that, uh, that statement, so to speak. And uh, for me, I was intuiting it that I am the most important person in my life. And so that makes me uh, subject to that my needs are first. And um, how I was uh, sort of experiencing that even just in my current everyday life right now. Uh, if I, I have a, a neighbor who is being extremely loud and what I think is disrespectful to the rental community here, but that is again me saying that I am the most important person in my life. And yet, of course, that other person is saying that same exact thing by their not attending to the needs of other people in the community. So it's, it's, a, it's a rather uh, different way of approaching the, the topic. And I'm wondering if you sort of can, can expound on that a little bit. Well, looking at it from the perspective of the way you're talking about it, uh, my mother used to say, uh, freedom is the right to swing your arm anywhere you want as long as you don't hit anybody. Mm. Uh, your neighbor is hitting somebody by their behavior. Uh, the, the bottom line on it is whether your neighbor is aware of what they're doing or not, their behavior is causing harm to others. Mm. Uh, I personally believe that, uh, uh, that the only real sin is hurting other people unnecessarily. Right. Uh, and, yeah. And when I say unnecessarily, sometimes it's necessary to hurt people in order for them to learn what they need to learn about how they're hurting themselves or others. Mm. On the other hand, uh, uh, when someone is doing something that is causing harm to others, I believe intervention of one kind or another is necessary. And mm -hmm. I believe that the, the name of the game is uh, getting the message across to that person in the way that is least harmful, but still gets the job done. So it's sort of important to note that there's, in a sense, there's two sides to that statement, that there is a very positive side as it relates to, let's say, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that mm -hmm. I am the most important person and I need to take care of my uh, hierarchy of needs because no one else is going to when you get right down to it. But then the flip side of it is that I may, in that uh, course of uh, believing that I am the most important to myself, I may infringe on others at the same time unknowingly. Mm -hmm. Or knowingly. You know, in fact, if you knowingly infringe on others and are uh, doing it uh, uh, with that awareness and it makes you feel better, that's really the definition of evil. Yes, yes. I love that you use that. We've uh, spoken about that uh, many times. So, mm -hmm. um, But at, uh, talking about Maslow's uh, hierarchy, uh, the simple reality is that at the top of that hierarchy is what he calls self-actualization. Mm. Uh, which uh, has to do with uh, understanding yourself and understanding the extent to which everything that everyone experiences gets processed through themselves. Uh, yeah, but in the shrink business, we have a phrase that everything is projection. Ah. In, the, uh, in the AA community, they say, if you spot it, you got it. Uh, mm. the, uh, the experiences that I've had uh, with times that I've felt something very strongly uh, have required me to take a look in the mirror and say, what it is about me that's putting that on that situation. Um, and, and it's interesting, in a sense, you know, to kind of just go back to the semantics of it, if we can a little bit, 
I think we might both be familiar with someone who doesn't put themselves as their most important person in the world. Perhaps uh, uh, a spouse who's in a, an abusive situation, um, who always has to put the spouse ahead of their needs um, and make the spouse the most important person in the world, which in a sense is a, a tremendous detriment to one's own soul. Um, and then uh, resulting health uh, uh, problems uh, that may in, in fact uh, be a result of not putting yourself as the most important person in your world. Well, one way of thinking of it is that uh, everyone has, uh, let's say 20 needs. I'm just pulling that number out of the hat. But uh, uh, in a relationship, if you can find somebody that meets say seven or eight of those needs, you're doing pretty well. Mm. And in order to get those needs met, you're probably going to have to give up seven or eight. And uh, the remaining needs, uh, you basically have to meet yourself. And if you don't have a way of meeting your own needs, or if your whole concept of yourself is I'm not worth anything unless I'm doing something for someone else, uh, then you're actually ignoring the reality of your situation, uh, which is that uh, if you don't meet your own needs, uh, your ability to meet other people's needs is highly limited. Wow, wow. And, and, and sort of that's one of the reasons that I wanted us specifically to use this topic as our initial podcast, because it sort of sets the framework uh, for us to build on in future podcasts from this very simple basic concept uh, that I am the most important person in the world to me, and that that is a mindset that as we actually go out into the world, we should probably keep in mind that that is what uh, anyone we interact with is also operating under. I agree. In fact, uh, I believe that uh, if you could stop the world and get inside the mind of every single person, uh, that what you would find is that they are probably thinking about themselves. Mm. They're thinking about someone else. They're often wondering, uh, I wonder what that person is thinking about me. And so uh, there's a, uh, the, in the, the best example I can think of is from the movie Beaches, uh, where uh, uh, Bette Midler is playing the role of a, uh, of a narcissistic actress who uh, puts on a show in front of her family and friends and uh, then comes out and talks to them about what a great job she did in, in her show. Uh, and then she says, but enough about me. Uh, let's talk about you. What did you think about my performance? <laughs> One of my favorite uh, lines. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, uh, it's almost impossible to, uh, to not uh, to think about anything without uh, understanding that you're filtering it through your own perceptions. Mm. And, uh, and once you realize that, uh, you have the opportunity to see yourself more objectively. Mm. Uh, most people do not see reality. What they see is a tangent from reality. If reality is a circle, uh, the tangent starts at the point where it touches the circle. But how they think about that depends an awful lot on what the circumstances are and, uh, and what their perception is. So I give an example, for example, in my dissertation, where uh, uh, if someone is talking to me and I'm trying to cover up a burp by smiling, <laughs> Uh, and they think I'm laughing at what they're saying. Uh -huh. And the tangent is the point at which I smile. But if they think I'm laughing at what, I, what, I'm, uh, what uh, they're saying, they assume I'm not taking them seriously. They assume that, uh, that I have a, a perception of them which is judgmental and negative, and they take off from there. And it's like uh, uh, picking up a fumble and running the wrong way with it and scoring a touchdown for the other team. It, it's interesting, you know, as I unpack this, this thought or this idea more, there's so many levels to it. And one of the things that I, I specifically uh, was interested in is that in the event of what you just said, where maybe somebody has misinterpreted something that I've said or done or have spoken, that it is important incumbent on me to try to reach that person in a non-threatening, non-judgmental, non-defensive way mm -hmm. so that 
there is a real communication here and that and that that is really important to me if i care about how my image is perceived in the world at large right, so it is about the conduct of myself and of my being whether it be my voice my actions etc in a way that is not just affirming to whoever I'm interacting with, but affirming to myself as well. As well. Yeah, I've uh, probably put a good part of the last uh, 60 years into learning to see myself as others see me. Mm. And uh, uh, I come across in a certain way and I think I know the role I'm playing, which is basically the role of good daddy. Uh, but the way other people perceive me uh, has a lot to do with what their experiences were of themselves and of their daddies. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the fact is that uh, uh, I am perceived as a, a smart guy. I'm perceived as a, uh, a powerful guy. Uh, the truth is I don't have any power except the power other people give me. Uh, but if I say something and someone assumes that I'm saying it uh, in some attempt to uh, criticize them or hurt them, they're wrong. Anything that I say is meant to help them, even if they see me as the enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and as they think about it later on, they have to deal with the fact that they can't find a way to interpret what I said that has me being in some way uh, evil or trying to harm them. Uh, and and, and so in that, again, it, it feels to me that it, it, it really goes back to the crux of the statement. I am the most important person to myself, uh, in the world to myself. And why, again, it's important, even on that person who may have misinterpreted you, to mm -hmm. actually strive very deeply to... Um, understand or to to not misinterpret that because mm -hmm. my misinterpreting you is actually a great disservice to myself and in a sense puts a little bit more import on you than it does again with that statement i am the most important person in the world to me That's and if right. I, and if that were the case then i it, i would strive very very deeply to uh, deeply understand a point of view that may be contrary to what I think I know. Got it exactly, Matt. That's exactly right. Because when someone tries to understand what I say, they're trying to get inside my head. They're trying to understand my motivation. And uh, if they can come up with any way that they can interpret my motivation as uh, anything other than trying to help them mm. and i want to know it because i'm not doing my job right mm. uh, so over the years many people have uh, seen me as the enemy have tried to uh, cause me trouble and uh, uh, my perception is that that's uh, they're giving me a lot of power and uh, and the more they give me power the more they try to understand why did i do what i did why did i say what i said mm. uh, good luck to them finding a negative motivation there uh, because uh, if I'm doing my job right uh, they can't explain my behavior and they're empowering me uh, in a way which forces them to understand where I'm coming from mm. uh, and if I'm coming from any place other than trying to help them something wrong with me and so I wanted to sort of actually kind of put this into context with our current paradigm in a sense we're coming out of you know the COVID-19 pandemic um, and, you know, there's been a mental health crisis. Why is this statement so important in our current paradigm today? Well, I think that everybody uh, on some level or other has had to deal with being isolated. Mm -hmm. And being isolated basically means uh, uh, you're stuck with yourself, your family, uh, uh, and uh, it's very hard to communicate with other people in physical ways, other than the direct family. Uh, basically, um, uh, COVID has forced all of us to look in the mirror in a way that most of us would rather not. Yeah. Uh, the uh, reality of it, though, is that 
there's no part of anybody that's not a part of me. And I really believe, uh, as uh, my uh, science fiction idol, Theodore Sturgeon said, that, uh, that uh, if everybody could be inside everybody else's mind at this moment, none of us would have any secrets and there would be no wars. Mm. But everybody's walking around saying, oh, I wish so-and-so didn't find out. I wish you didn't know what I'm thinking and I wish they didn't realize it. And everybody has their secrets. Uh, uh, probably the, uh, uh, the Billy Joel song uh, uh, that uh, refers to the masks that everybody wears is a, is a good example of that. The reality mm. is we're all trying to hide stuff from other people. And if there is nothing to hide, uh, we all realize that we're just human beings doing the best we can. Uh, and uh, uh, if we get in the right state of mind, we learn from our mistakes and we grow. Well, and you, you, you uh, made a statement here, which I love because it's going to be the topic of one of our next uh, uh, podcasts here that um, uh, there's no part of you that's not a part of me, but we'll, we'll save that for one of our future uh, podcasts here because, again, it's a very deep uh, subject that I think is very important as we, again, build this foundation here of our, of our uh, talks here. And again, with the statement, I am the most important... I'm Anything sorry? that happens to you uh, is something that you can interpret in a way that allows you to either grow or shrivel. Uh, if you stay the same, then you haven't really interpreted it in a way that uh, that facilitates your soul's growth. Uh. Uh, so my belief is that, uh, uh, that the job that all of us have is to take advantage of the fact that we're still alive and find a way to grow from the experiences we have, learn and grow. Uh, if we don't learn or decide that what it means is something that proves to us that the world is uh, shriveling and that we're no good, uh, then we wind up spinning things in a way that does not work for us. Well, and again, to bring it back into the current paradigm here with COVID-19, the vaccine is, uh, is an example here um, that I kind of want to just touch on in that if I am the most important person in the world to me, uh, then my health is the one of the most paramount things to me to you know for my longevity and so that would stand to reason that the vaccine is something that if you believe you are the most important person in the world to you that you would act on or even the converse because if you you know don't personally believe in vaccines if you're what is you know commonly referred to as an anti-vaxxer that you may be taking the opposite viewpoint that you're not taking it until it's been proven so that you don't suffer any uh, unwarranted side effects that may negatively impact your health. And this in a sense is what I, what I think is really interesting is about the dichotomy of that statement. Mm -hmm. uh, I am the most important person in the world to myself. It can be uh, either anti-vaxxer or it can be someone who's pro-vax vaccination and going out at the first opportunity to, to get vaccinated. Well, I am the most important person in the world to myself. Uh, does not take into account what many people believe, which is that the way that you need to define yourself is in terms of your relationships. So you have the, the difficulty of, even if that's true, uh, uh, and you choose not to take the vaccine, uh, you have relationships with people. And those, uh, those relationships and whether those people that you have relationships with are communicating the disease has to be taken into account also. Uh, the, uh, the other thing to understand here is that we are coming against the conflict of, uh, of science and beliefs. Uh, and most people don't really understand science. Science is a matter of disproof, not a, not a means of proving anything. Uh, so when you scientifically uh, test something, you're basically testing it against the hypothesis that, uh, uh, that it doesn't work. And, uh, and if it works better than chance uh, or better than you would expect, then you have scientifically eliminated the possibility that it happened by chance. Uh, that doesn't change the fact that, uh, uh, that the concept of defining you, so yourself in terms of relationships does, uh, should also include the relationships you have with the different parts of you. Mm. I have parts of myself that are different ages. Uh, 
Mm. And at each age, we have uh, developmental uh, ways of understanding things. So the part of me that's three years old believes that when I walk out of the room, the furniture disappears. Uh, fortunately, there are other parts of me that understand that that's not the case. Uh, the part of me that, uh, that uh, is two years old uh, believes uh, that, that pat -a cake works. <laughs> and pat -a cake is based on the idea that uh, you can't see me. The reason you can't see me is because I can't see you. Uh, it has to do with the way in which uh, other people perceive you. And I have worked my entire life to try and understand how other people see me. And to the extent that I project a, uh, uh, an image of a, a, a powerful good daddy, I'm doing my job. Mm -hmm. And again, it goes back to, again, our earlier point that, again, if you are the most important person in the world to you, how you are perceived by others would be rather important to that part of your personality uh, that is taking care of this. It's creating a loop. And from my point of view, the kind of loop that makes the most sense is one which does not uh, go after power. Mm. Uh, the concept of, uh, of power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, is in fact uh, uh, true if, unless the power that you are seeking is the power to help others. And in order to do that, you have to see yourself as others see you. So the correct loop from my point of view is understanding that my effect on somebody has helped them to grow rather than shrivel. Mm -hmm. And as all of us are on an, uh, an individual journey from exiting the womb to uh, being six feet under, we're all on an individual journey that is different uh, for all three or seven billion people on this planet. That's exactly right. Everybody in the world thinks differently from everybody else. Uh, and it's a result of our combination of heredity and experience. But the reality is that uh, uh, when somebody sees me and doesn't want to, uh, uh, to tell me something because it's embarrassing, mm. uh, what I usually say to them is, uh, if you tell me something I've never heard before, I'll scream. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I don't scream very much. Mm. Uh, but the truth is that, uh, that there are categories of thinking, and I'm pretty aware of those. And so uh, ways of thinking, uh, 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 there are only just so many, and I understand most of those. And if someone does say something that's a different way of thinking than I've experienced before, uh, I won't scream, but I'll be excited. That means mm. I'm going to learn something I didn't know before. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, it's extremely important for me to recognize that every time someone says something, it's something I've never heard before. Their way of thinking about it is different from the way that anyone else thinks about it. Uh, my common phrase to people uh, when they consult me is, your soul is my boss. Mm. And as long as I keep that in mind, and my job is to understand their soul, uh, then I'm in a position to help them become better people. Mm. This is especially important for me because uh, in our current paradigm, there are what are called social justice warriors who are trying to make the world a better place for others. Mm -hmm. And it's important, I think, for us to realize that in that attempt, they're still keeping that paradigm very front and focused that they are the most important person in the, in the world to them and they believe that what they are doing is right, and it is important for their soul to feel like they're contributing to the betterment of mankind. Mm -hmm. Yes, but of course, uh, the flip side of that is to what extent are they laying their trip on other people? Mm. And uh, again, the issue becomes who's getting hurt, and uh, uh, are you having an opportunity to learn from your mistakes? Mm. Uh, none of us are perfect and we all make mistakes uh, the thing that concerns me about the, even the phrase cancel culture is that it doesn't seem to take that into account mm. are there any other ways that we can interpret that that uh saying uh that tweet of yours i am the most important person in the world to me things that we haven't spoken about here today that you'd like to kind of delve a little bit deeper into 
Well, I think that that uh, the primary thing to understand is that uh, we all have uh, at least two minds, a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And the subconscious mind is basically a brilliant slave. Uh, it does what it's told. The conscious mind is the boss. Unfortunately, the conscious mind is somewhat limited, even though it can give the orders. The conscious mind can keep track of at the most seven variables at a time. Uh, when I was running groups, as soon as I had more than seven people in the group, I was clumping them. I was saying, oh, those are the alcoholics over there or something like that. Uh, whereas the subconscious mind is capable of turning the solution to your problems into a motion picture with sound and a story. That's what a dream is. Uh, and think of how many thousands of variables have to be manipulated in order to turn the solution to your problems into a movie. Uh, and the subconscious mind is trying its best to get a message across to the conscious mind, usually about a stupid order the conscious mind is giving. So if you've experienced something that was traumatic, often the conscious mind says, make sure that never happens again. Mm. And of course, the subconscious can't do that. And, uh, uh, and the conscious mind says, I don't want to hear about that. I never want to think about that again. And the subconscious now has the problem that the boss has given an order, uh, which makes it very difficult to go on living in the right way because the order is contradictory to uh, survival. Mm. So the subconscious has to come up with a dream that, uh, that gets the attention of the conscious mind. And the biggest mistake most people think is to assume that, uh, that dreams are basically nightmares and they're bad and that they're trying to, uh, to, to scare you. When in fact, it's just the subconscious trying to get your attention. And if you become the different parts of the dream, as Fritz Perls did in most of his work, uh, you wind up uh, uh, understanding parts of yourself and making a relationship with parts of yourself that previously you were trying to avoid. So the deeper level of I am the most important person in my, my life is that there are all kinds of parts of me that I need to understand better in order for me to actually take proper care of myself. Mm. Not to mention the relationships I have with others. And, you know, this is one of the reasons that I've been a, a client of yours for a number of years is that um, I would say I'm trying to learn uh, or even have a better relationship uh, with aspects of myself that I didn't know or aspects of myself that I don't particularly, particularly like. Well, the truth is, Matt, that uh, uh, you're uh, one of a very few people who uh, is alive because of uh, uh, some sort of uh, circumstance that uh, should have you dead. Mm. And uh, uh, I don't know, are you, are you comfortable with my sharing? Yeah, you know, there are no shared secrets here. Um, you know, for those who who don't know, uh, again, I've been a, a, a client uh, of Dr. Neal's for a number of years, um, and there have been um, some pretty serious suicide attempts, as you would say, Dr. Neal, a 10 on the scale of 10, or even an 11 on the scale of 10 in terms of the seriousness of a suicide attempt on my uh, behalf. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that uh, I certainly did survive. Uh, the hero story continues. Um, and I'm fortunate to have learned people such as yourself, who I like to consider on my team, um, because I don't believe we can go it alone in today's society. And we need people such as yourself who don't have a vested interest or a biased viewpoint, such as maybe a family member or a friend may have. You're completely unbiased. And as again, you had said, the job of your soul is to make sure that my soul is uh, going to be doing the best that it can. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, the truth is that suicide, uh, as is commonly said in my business, is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. I love that. I have to say, I, I've incorporated that into my own viewpoint now. Good. But the reality is that you shouldn't be alive. Mm. The reality is that uh, you took a loaded gun and pointed it at your heart and pulled the trigger. That is an 11 on a scale of 10 of trying to end your life. Uh, the fact that you survived uh, is more the result of your not knowing where your heart was. <laughs> I missed everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And since then, uh, we've been working on your understanding why it is that mm. you're still alive mm. and what uh, raison d'etre, what reason to be, you can come up with that will work for you and allow you to take full advantage of the fact that uh, you shouldn't be alive, but still are. And, and you know, to again, pull that back into our topic here today, would you, would it be a safe statement to say that I lost sight of that statement, that I am the most important person in the world to me at that time, and that uh, led to, to, to that, to that action? Um, I'm, again, as we say, it's, a, it's an 11 on a scale of 10, and uh, I, I know for myself, I was in what I would uh, term the tunnel of darkness. Mm -hmm. um, and for those who have maybe uh, walked in that tunnel or ridden in that tunnel, they, they may very much understand what I'm speaking about, that um, it's very much tunnel vision and uh, the peripheral is, is gone. It's, it's very, very tunnel-like. Um, and so as we bring it back to our topic, uh, you know, I, I would say that, you know, perhaps I lost sight of that uh, in that tunnel of darkness. Yes, yes. I believe that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you were in a rage. Mm. One part of you was trying to kill another part of you. Mm. And those two parts were not talking to each other. And uh, I think those two parts are communicating with each other now, uh, although they wouldn't be and shouldn't be if it hadn't been for the pure chance of your missing your shot. Mm, mm, yeah. And, uh, you know, to that end, um, I was not uh, under your care uh, at that time. Um, mm -hmm. I was very much in an isolation uh, in my own bubble or again, in my own tunnel of darkness. Um, and I remember, you know, what was going, I remember what was going through my, my head at the time that I didn't want to be a burden to anybody. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, not being under your care and not ha or, or under the care of a, a professional uh, such as, such as yourself. Um, so I didn't have that uh, ability for circumspection, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, uh, tunnel vision is not a bad concept there. Uh, but to understand that uh, there are parts of me uh, that feel like they deserve to be shot. There are parts of me that feel like shooting those parts of me. Mm -hmm. And until I can totally empathize with both parts until I can, for want of another word, love the mm. part of me that, uh, that is both in a rage and both feels like I deserve to die. Until I can uh, get that, uh, sometimes it's referred to as radical acceptance. Right. Yeah? But loving someone means wanting what's best for them, even if it's not what's best for you. And if you really love somebody, uh, you, accept the fact that they deserve to live and the issue is what's best for them mm -hmm. uh, and the reality is that what was best for the part of you that wanted to kill uh, the part of you that wanted to that, that was provoking it uh, uh, that what was actually best was for uh, for there to be pure empathy mm -hmm. for one part to be inside the mind of the other part and for them to join and uh, the person who did the most work on this was a guy named Carl Rogers, uh, whose concept was what's currently thought of as active listening. Mm. I remember getting totally infuriated myself at watching a, uh, uh, a video of Carl Rogers talking to someone who was suicidal. And the person who was suicidal was saying, uh, uh, there's no reason for me to live. Nobody understands me. Nobody listens to me. Nobody pays any attention to me. I might as well be dead. And Carl Rogers was saying, it seems like nobody ever hears you. It seems like whatever you say, there's never anybody to, to pay attention to you. And uh, after watching, you know, half an hour of this, uh, I wanted to get up and, and grab the guy and say, Rogers is listening to you. Can't you see that? <laughs> But by the end of the, uh, of the video, the guy had decided not to kill himself. Mm. And the only thing Rogers did was reflect back what he was saying. Mm. Rogers well, became the part of him that uh, needed to listen to him. 
And I, I think that you hit on, you know, a, a, a word there that I think is really key to this subject. And that is the radical acceptance of self. Mm -hmm. If you are the most important person in the world to you, you that that is only true if you radically accept every part of your personality, especially those that you're not happy with or you don't like um, uh, and whatnot. That's exactly right. In fact, uh, most of the parts of ourselves that we don't like come from other people. Mm -hmm. When you're a child and you're getting yelled at or being brought up by somebody, uh, the issue of uh, it's no fun being yourself and you don't have any power. You're basically traumatized. You're trapped, helpless, powerless, perhaps petrified with fear. No fun being yourself. Might as well become the person who's yelling at you. Mm. Uh, that's why uh, uh, during the Second World War, there were some Jews walking around goose-stepping and acting like Germans. Mm. There was no power in being a Jew at Auschwitz. At the same time, the concept of identification with the aggressor, which was later interpreted as the Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome. Thank yeah. you. I, I was that's searching a, for that word. Yeah. It's that basic uh, idea that uh, uh, you incorporate uh, the... Uh, the uh, enemy's state of mind mm. into yourself. And the result is that you hate yourself. Mm. And most people don't understand that the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. And it's, it's so interesting as you know, we, we dive deeper and deeper in here. I, I certainly can uh, identify uh, where this separation for me occurred. And it was about eight years old uh, when mm -hmm. I was terrorized by my sadistic sister um, mm -hmm. who took great glee in, in uh, traumatizing me. And mm -hmm. at one point identifying with her aggression, which has led to years of self-loathing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, uh... Eight years old is a very interesting age, you know, because developmentally Piaget showed that, that that's the age at which you can get inside the perception of another person. Uh, it's a very limited perception, but a seven-year-old if placed in front of a paper mache mountain range and a doll placed at the other side of the mountain range, if the seven-year-old is asked, what does the doll see? The seven-year-old will choose what he or she sees. Hmm. An eight-year-old can choose what the doll would see. Hmm. And so there's an actual change of perception that takes place between seven and eight. Now, when I was eight years old, uh, I was so furious with my mother that I locked myself in the bathroom and uh, uh, had figured out how I was going to kill myself. Hmm. And I had razor blades there and all the rest of that. And uh, my mother was so terrified that she called my father, who was my model for what a good daddy should be. And he started asking me questions and I said, uh, you know, I can't wait to see her face after I'm dead. And he said, well, how are you going to do that? <laughs> That's why I didn't kill myself when I was eight years old. Mm. So, you know, as we uh, wrap up here, would you say that you're trying to, uh, you know, for the last, let's say, 60 years, carry on the work of your father, perhaps? To a great degree. And uh, maybe if I've done it right, in some areas, I can uh, do a little better than he did. The oh, last year of his life, my father ate himself to death. He gained 100 pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I've had to work very hard on keeping from uh, being substantially overweight and uh, trying to not make the mistake my father made. Uh, and by the way, my best friend did the same thing uh, some 40 years after that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, has been very difficult because uh, understanding uh, I come from a, a background that's uh, half Jewish and half Italian. And if you want screwed up attitudes towards food, just check those cultures out. <laughs> you know, as I, as I speak with you, what really helps in, in, in my uh, interaction with you is to recognize that whilst I may put you on a pedestal as the good daddy, quote unquote, uh, to use your words, that you also are not infallible, that you struggle with weight issues. I struggle with weight issues. So to know that you struggle with it as well, uh, 30 years 
uh, or 50 years, or excuse me, 20 years older than myself, mm -hmm. and have also had, uh, you know, thoughts of self-harm, it, 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 it shows your humanity to me and puts it in a more real context mm -hmm. so that it becomes, so good mental health becomes more attainable for me. Does that make sense? Of course, you know, we're both just guys doing the best we can to, uh, to improve ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've made quite a big, quite a lot of progress and uh, hopefully I have too. But if there's ever somebody that uh, I can't get inside their minds, uh, that's a challenge to me, and uh, I'll keep working on it uh, because I love the puzzle of understanding how someone else thinks. So our topic again is I am the most important person in the world to myself. Uh, do you have final thoughts on that topic, Neil? Well, the most important person I can be to myself is someone who understands other people and helps them to be more important to themselves. If I'm doing that, I'm doing my job right, and it gives me a rush. Yeah. Anything else, I'm probably being selfish. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, selfish to me means being able to help other people. There's nothing wrong with being selfish if you're helping other people. On the other hand, if, uh, if uh, you're out for yourself at the expense of other people, you're playing around with, uh, 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 with either uh, crazy or evil. Uh, crazy is doing something that... Uh, uh, that hurts others or yourself, and you're not aware of it. Evil is doing something that makes yourself feel better at someone else's expense and knowing it. My guest today and my co-host is Dr. Neil Marinello. He's a behavior expert with, uh, I would say, over 60 years in the uh, behavior field. Uh, we're speaking about tweets on his uh, Twitter page. You can follow him at Coach Dr. Neil. You're welcome to also subscribe to this podcast and to like it and to ask a question. And in our next podcast, we'll do our best to answer it. Dr. Neil Marinello, on behalf of uh, the doctor, I'm Matt Kelly, wishing you good mental health.